Gunna Stay, how are ye? Welcome to another episode of the Candlelit Tales podcast, episode 164, and a very special podcast indeed because Surika and I, the brother and sister of the co founders of Candlelit Tales, are from a town very close by to Blarney. And this episode is all about Blarney, the fantastic Blarney stone that gives you the gift of the gab. And if you don't know about it, you'll know about it after this episode. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can go to patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales or to candlelittales.ie to throw us a few bob or find out what we're doing with live gigs and the like. Now, before I keep on carrying on, thanks very much to Patreon supporters and everyone who sent us a message thanking us for doing what we do. We love you so much. Thank you for the continued inspiration. And, well, look, here's a story for you. All about Blarney. Here's Surika. Tell us a story, will you? Blarney. It's a lovely place today. You barely see the scars of war. The village green with the low stone wall around it. And at the turnstile at the gate, it's not armed guardsmen that greet you. It's ticket takers and sellers. And as you come in, around the castle, you don't see garrisons. You don't see soldiers. You see the gardens, lovely and manicured. But people don't come here for the gardens, though they might stay a while and walk. The castle itself, when you see it, it doesn't call to mind romantic tales of knights and ladies. It's brutal and blocky. And the ceiling is gone and there are no rooms. You can see the arrow slits where archers once stood, breathing hard, fingers on the strings waiting for the moment to draw and release, waiting for the sound of a scream or a silence to tell them if they'd hit or missed their mark. You can see the channels they carved into the stone so they could pour hot oil down on besiegers and attackers. All these old ghosts all this old violence remembered. This castle was built on the ruin of another castle. It was built by Cormac Lauder, Cormac the Strong. The Earl of Muscry, the ninth to hold that title. His father before him had been the seventh and Cormac Lauder had murdered and warred and fought his way to his title, for he was the ninth. And the seventh and the eighth lords, well, they were pushed aside by Cormac Lauder himself. One killed by his hand, and the other deposed. Cormac Lauder was well used to battle, and well used to strife. And when his castle was ruined, he rebuilt it. Stone by stone. He was a sad, wise man. He had seen so much death and destruction in his time. And he was a man who knew how to live by the sword and was ready to die by it too. War was a way of life in those days as the Gaelic lords vied for position and power. And across the sea, the King of England, Henry, cast his eye over Ireland and declared himself its king, with never a by your leave. The lords of Muscry were descended from the Malaysians. They traced their lineage all the way back, 
back to the time when Eremon and Eberdon, the sons of Mill, defeated the two of the Danann at the Battle of Tal II and divided the island between them. Eremon taking the south, Eberdon the north. And it was from that southern king, Eremon, that the McCarthys traced their oldest ancestors. And so when a king, a foreign king, declared himself their ruler, they did not take to it. Many of them did not. Though there were those who saw the advantages. And those that saw the advantage and those that did not, they warred and they fought and they strove among themselves, and division and dissent was their downfall. These were the old royalty of Ireland, the old lords for whom the Banshee cried. And the McCarthys, they were not of that list. They were not one of the families the Banshee was said to wail for. But they had their own connection. It was said that the Queen of the Banshee, Cleona, daughter of Mananon MacLear, dweller in the other world, that she favoured them. She watched out for them. She watched over the McCarthy clan. That was of the old faith. There was, of course, a new faith now in Ireland, brought by Patrick and his kind many years before. And the McCarthys were of the new faith. But across the sea, a newer faith still was being organised. As Henry VIII sought time and time again to have an heir by any means he could. And a newer faith on top of a new faith, on top of an old faith that was still there, was a little too much for the McCarthys. To get behind. Cormac Lauder was not a man to think too much of faith, old or new or older still, and not a man to think much of a goddess who might or might not have favoured his clan. And if they did favour him, it was not something that he saw. And that was his belief for many years. But while he was rebuilding his castle, ruined in a siege, while he was gathering the materials, a court case was brought against him. Now Cormac Lauder, he knew how to fight and he knew how to win. He had fought time and time again and he had won. He'd won his earlship. He'd captured the chief of the O'Connor Kerries. He'd fought alongside the Earl of Desmond at the Battle of Morne. He'd besieged James Fitzmaurice after a raid in Dungarvan. He sent 5,000 of his men to aid Robert the Bruce. He knew war and he knew it well. But this was a new kind of battle for him. Fighting with words was not something he knew how to do. He was a man of blunt and simple speech. And so the night before he was due to leave, he slept uneasily, tossing and turning in his bed. His lady wife beside him rose from her sleep and left him to find her rest somewhere else. And in the deep part of the night, when all was silent and sleeping around him, it seemed to him that he dreamed, and the door of his chamber opened, and a woman walked in. He'd never seen her before then, but she looked familiar to him, tall and graceful, a beautiful woman. He should know her name. He felt it was on the tip of his tongue. 
but his lips and his tongue felt numb and stupid. And he could not make them move, even to shape a greeting, even to call out a challenge. And the woman stepped up. And he realised that even though there was no light in his chamber, he could see her clearly. Every line of her, it was as if she was lit from within. And as she stepped softly towards him, she spoke to him in a voice low and musical. And she called him McCarthy. And she said, I am your friend. I have always been your friend. And I will be a friend to your family until the end of time. And all you need do is call on me. Ask for my help and you shall receive. And do you need my help, Cormac Lauder? And Cormac, still dazed and dreaming, he could not make his mouth shape words, but he nodded his head. And the woman smiled. And she said, In the morning, kiss the first stone that you see. And think of me. And then she was gone. And he could move again. And he sat up in bed, not sure if he had been dreaming or waking. The moon was hitting the floor at just the same angle. But where a woman had been standing, there was no one. And the next day he set out. It was a long journey, a long ride ahead of him. But he took his time. He broke his fast. He spoke to his wife, he told her the dream he'd had. And she looked at him and she said, I think that you should do it. The gifts of the good people, they should be honoured and not lightly put aside. And so when he set off down the road, he kept his eye open. And when he saw a rock, he got off his horse and he walked over to it. And feeling only a little foolish in front of his men, he bent down and he kissed it. And then he went on his way. But when it came time for him to speak in court a thing he had never done before, he found his tongue was not thick and heavy. It was light and nimble as a sword. He was able to block and parry and riposte with the best of them. And he was able to make it all go away. And so when he came back on that return journey, He found that stone that he had kissed and he had his men take it up and set it in the battlements of his castle as they finished the rebuilding. Now the woman had never given her name but who else could she be but the queen of the Banshee? Cleona, who'd always had a special interest in their family. And so when Cormac was older and his joints were growing stiff he brought his son and soon-to-be successor Cormac Tighe McCarthy up onto the battlements with him. They climbed the narrow winding staircase, the new hewn stones sharp against their shoes, climbed up past all the arrow slits until they were on the very roof, looking out over the lands of Muscree, over the trees and the river. And then he told his son to kiss the stone. It was set out 
away from the roof over a gap. And Cormac Tighe had to bend backwards and lean out precariously to press his lips to the stone his father had set there. But he did it, although his heart leapt in his chest and the blood rushed to his head. He pressed his lips to it. And his father hoped that the goddess's gift would be passed on. And perhaps it was. For Cormac Tighe had different battles to fight. When he was Lord of Muscree, the monarch across the sea was Queen Elizabeth. And she had little patience for followers of the old faith. She followed the faith of her father. And she made the rules and set the laws so that the lands of the Catholic earls could be confiscated in Ireland and given to her allies for fear that they would scheme against her because they schemed against her. And Blarney was in her sights, this castle of the McCarthys, the lords of Muscree. And Cormac Tighg was summoned to her court a longer journey than his father had ever made. Cormac Tighe found himself crossing the sea. And as he smelled the salt in the air and the sea breeze played with his hair, he recalled to himself the Cleona, that goddess who favoured his family. She was the queen of the Banshees and she was said to be the daughter of Mananon MacLear, king of the sea. And so he made a little salute to her in the quiet of his own heart. And he pressed his fingers to his lips and tried to recall the feel of the stone against them. On that day his father had brought him up to the battlements of their castle. When Cormac Tighe came to the court of the Queen and the case against him was presented he responded with such wit and logic and illogic such nonsense and flattery and circuitous arguments the Queen could say nothing That is a load of blarney. And Cormac Tighe kept his castle, kept his land, kept his family's title. And the McCarthys hold it still. That family descended from the sons of Mill, favoured by the goddess Cleona. They who hold the blarney stone. And that is what they come for to this day. Those who walk through the lovely grounds, the rock garden, the ferns, the forest and the river, who climb up the wooden staircase that rises up through what was once the Great Hall. That is why they lean back and press their lips to the stone with their knees held and the grate now below them to protect them from falling. They press their lips against the stone in hope that the goddess will smile on them as well. Perhaps she will. This podcast was produced and edited by Oshin Ryan and Alan Holman. 
You can find out more about us on our website, candlelittales.ie. And we're on all social media, so like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at Candlelit Tales or send us a message or get onto our mailing list. For more videos and live streams, like and subscribe to our Candlelit Tales YouTube channel, which now has a Candlelit Tales for Kids playlist. Hashtag Candlelittle Tales. Liking and subscribing to our channel really helps us grow and get to more people. And if you're able to give us more direct support, you can chip in a few bob at patreon.com forward slash Candlelit Tales or make a one-time donation through the PayPal button on our website. We also do really like to hear back from you with your questions and requests. So please feel free to contact us directly or leave your question in the comment section below. Because what we really want to do is get these stories out there. Share them with as many people as possible. So anything you can do to help, we really appreciate. And we really appreciate you listening. Gurmila Magar.